Darwin apologized for the paucity of evidence he had for his theory. This was modesty on his part as he had accumulated quite a bit of data, observational and experimental. But since his time, quite a bit of evidence has been confirming the main principles of his original theory and modifying the rough edges of it as well. One of the first lines of evidence pursued by Darwin in The Origin of Species is the fact of artificial selection. Artificial selection is the modification of species by humans using selective breeding to change organisms from their wild-type forms. For one example, I refer to this image from the text as Five Ways to Ruin Thanksgiving. These five vegetables, kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, and kohlrabi, are not found in nature. These vegetables, in fact all of our plant foods, have been artificially selected by breeders for centuries to generate new varieties. Furthermore, all five of these vegetables have been derived from a single species of wild mustards, Brassica oleracea. You might even guess at another vegetable that we could add to this slide, a sixth way to ruin Thanksgiving, cauliflower, which was artificially selected from broccoli. Just about every domesticated and cultivated commodity that we have is the product of selection by humans. On this slide, you can see just a few examples of the products of artificial selection. Breeds of dogs, chickens, cattle, varieties of apples, avocados, mangoes, all well-documented examples of humans' ability to change populations of organisms through non-random selection. For his own part, Darwin experimented with artificial selection. He did so as both a scientist and a Victorian age British man of means. He infiltrated the elite circle of pigeon fanciers who collected and raced pigeons and produced many varieties, fantails and powders and the list goes on. We have witnessed natural selection directly. Though several examples of direct observation exist, including follow-up studies with Darwin's finches in the Galapagos and with soapberry bugs, both discussed in the textbook, I will only tell you about one example, a frightening one, drug-resistant bacteria. In the early 1940s, in blitz-ravaged England, penicillin became the first antibiotic used to treat bacterial disease in humans. It was amazingly effective, an almost miraculous cure. However, it was only a matter of a few years before the first penicillin-resistant strains of Staphylococcus aureus started to appear in patients. Staphylococcus is better known by its shortened name, Staph, as in Staph infections. This behavior in bacteria was actually predicted by Alexander Fleming in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech for the discovery of penicillin. New antibiotics were and are still being developed. Another one, methicillin, was introduced in 1959. Again, two years of miraculous success in treatment, then, again, resistant strains began appearing that could not be treated with methicillin or penicillin. We have been able to sequence the entire chromosome of Staphylococcus aureus and identify genes that enable the bacteria to resist antibiotics such as methicillin. I will link to this video at the end of this lecture, though as this lecture is getting kind of long, I will not require it but offer it as a supplementary source. The next line of evidence I want to tell you about is homology. Homology is similarity between organisms based on shared common ancestry. Organisms possess these homologous structures or features based on the structure being present in the shared ancestor, though the structure may be modified. These structures may be anatomical, or they may just be found in the sequences of nucleotides or amino acids. One example of homology is the arrangement of bones in the forelimb, what we might call the arm. You have, in your arm, a series of bones, the humerus, the ulna and radius, the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, all in that order. This same arrangement of bones is found in most of the terrestrial vertebrates and all mammals. Why do we share this same arrangement of forelimb bones? Because that is the arrangement found in our shared common ancestor. Cats, whales, and bats have these bones, 
but they all use them for different purposes. True that a cat may use their forelimbs like an arm in some circumstances, but most of the time they use them to walk upon, and a cat cannot throw a split-fingered fastball. Whales use their forelimbs for swimming. The phalanges have been thickened and elongated and become completely covered in muscle and skin. In the bat, the arm bones are covered with a thin membrane of skin, all the better to fly with as wings. Speaking of wings, insects also have wings, though their wings are not homologous with bat wings. That is to say, the common ancestor of bats and insects did not have wings. Insects don't have internal skeletons, much less humerus, ulna, radius, etc. But wings are found in almost all insects because the common insect ancestor possessed them. Insect wings are arranged as two pairs, a set of four wings and a set of hind wings. In beetles, the four wings are hardened for protection, and only the hind wings function for flight. In flies, the forewings flap for flying, and the hind wings are reduced into balancing structures. In butterflies, both the forewings and hind wings are used for flight. Four wings, hind wings, six legs, antennae, all of these are homologous anatomical features of insects. Comparative anatomy is often helpful for identifying homologies and the development from a zygote to a mature organism often reveals features that cannot be observed in the adults. For example, vertebrate embryos undergo a developmental stage where we have pharyngeal pouches, vestiges of the gill slits found in fish embryos that develop into the gills, as well as a postanal tail. This chicken will retain its postanal tail, but in human embryos, our post-anal tail gets reabsorbed. Identifying homologies is how phylogenies are constructed, and these homologies also reflect the nested hierarchies of Linnaeus. This phylogeny shows the evolutionary history of the vertebrates. I've added in a fossil find as well, an important transitional form between the fishes and the amphibians called Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik may be one of the first animals to occupy the planet with a humerus and radius, etc. Notice, at each of the branch points, there is something new not present in the shared common ancestor, but present in all the descendants. Digit-bearing limbs, fingers and toes. The presence of an amnion, which enables life on land. Feathers. In these cases, the descendants of that ancestor all possess that character. Convergent evolution is a different type of evolution, but evolution nonetheless. In convergent evolution, similarities arise not by shared common ancestry, but by shared common utility. We call these features analogous rather than homologous. It will behoove you to understand the difference between homology and analogy because I will certainly ask you about it. When similar habitats arise in different parts of the planet, we see similar structures may appear, but not because of a shared common ancestor. As an example, in the eucalyptus forests of Australia, there is a small mammal that can climb trees and use flaps of skin connecting the fore and hind limbs to glide between trees. This mammal is called a sugar glider. In the forests of North America, we too have a small mammal that looks and behaves much like a sugar glider, only it is a flying squirrel. Sugar gliders are marsupials, and flying squirrels are placental mammals. This means that sugar gliders are much more closely related to kangaroos and wombats and koalas, and that flying squirrels are much more recently related to rabbits and beavers and, well, you and me. The similarity in these sky gliders is due to them both being forest mammals that spend most of their lives scurrying about in trees. Another example of convergent evolution is the things with wings. Here are four examples of living things with wings. A bat, a butterfly, a bird, and a maple tree. They all have wings. They all share common ancestry because they are all eukaryotes, but the common eukaryotic ancestor did not have wings. 
why did wings evolve convergently in four different lineages? Because flying is a very useful way to get around. It enables the maple tree to get the seeds far away from the mother tree so they don't compete for sunlight. Wings allow butterflies to find sources of nectar and mates over great distances. But, as I already said, their wings are not filled with bones, and they are not modified legs. The butterfly already has six legs to walk with when necessary. And while birds' wings use all the bones of the forelimb, bat wings are mostly hand, as you can see in the picture. So, these winged things all come by their wings in different ways and for different purposes, but all are capable of flight. We can map these winged things onto a phylogeny and see how they are related to each other, but the ancestors that these connections represent are not things with wings, and that is convergent evolution. Another line of evidence for evolution is one I've mentioned previously, fossils. The fossil record shows the birth and death of groups of organisms and changes within those groups. I'll give just one example. Here is Alabama's state fossil, the unfortunately named Basilosaurus. Why is it unfortunately named? In contrast to what was first thought, it is not a dinosaur. Not at all. In fact, this is a mammal, and not just any mammal. You might be able to guess where this particular mammal lived its life. It was an aquatic marine mammal. This is an ancestor of modern cetaceans, which are the whales and dolphins. Here is a phylogeny of the cetaceans, which, as you can see, share common ancestry with hippos and more distant ancestry with the even-toed ungulates, such as deer, cattle, sheep, goats, and the like. In this phylogeny, there are three extinct ancestors of modern cetaceans represented, Pachycetus, Rhodocetus, and Dorodon. Fossils of these ancestors have been found in sedimentary rock around the world. And these fossils reflect a transition from terrestrial life to semi-aquatic to fully aquatic as evident from the change in shape of the hind limb bones that you can see on the far right over here. And as the hind limbs change through evolutionary history, we also see the nostrils migrating back from the front of the face to the top of the head and back behind the eyes, forming a blowhole. We can even place Basilosaurus on this phylogeny based on the age of the geological strata in which it's been found, which also conforms to the patterns observed with the anatomical features as far as the structure of the vestigial pelvis. A last line of evidence for evolution that I will tell you about is biogeography. Biogeography considers the geographic distribution of living species. Alfred Russell Wallace, in addition to his contributions to the idea of natural selection, is also called the father of biogeography. Our understanding of biogeography has greatly benefited from the discovery of continental drift and the knowledge that the arrangement of continents today are not also fixed and permanent. To put biogeography very plainly, let me ask you this. Why do I not see penguins when I go outside? Sounds like a silly question, but it's not entirely so. Penguins don't live around here. The nearest natural populations of penguins is found just north of the equator in the Galapagos Islands. The southern hemisphere is the place to find the 17 species of penguins in the wild. But why should that be so? These are the kinds of questions that biogeography can ask and answer. One dimension of biogeography is endemism. Endemic species are found in a particular location and nowhere else in the natural world. For example, you could say that penguins are endemic to the southern hemisphere and Galapagos Islands. You won't find a natural population of penguins anywhere other than that. And no, zoo populations do not count. Islands, like the Galapagos Archipelago, are rich in endemic species. And these endemic species usually show signs of being descended from the nearest large landmass, as the Galapagos species were similar to species found in South America. 
Darwin saw this pattern and reasoned that the new island environment would have different criteria for fitness, which would lead to the origin of new species. As it happens, Alabama is a hot spot for biodiversity and endemism. The Encyclopedia of Alabama has some interesting things to say on the subject, including this. Alabama ranks fourth in species diversity in the United States, after Hawaii, Florida, and California. Much of that biodiversity is in frequently overlooked taxa like mussels, snails, and crayfish. One reason for all of this great biodiversity is that Alabama is rich in waterways, and our great geologic diversity dissects these waterways, creating islands in reverse. Instead of isolated bits of land surrounded by water, our state has isolated bits of water surrounded by land. So, to sum up this section on lines of evidence for evolution, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that has accumulated since Darwin's time. And, to borrow a quote from Darwin himself, I can here give only the general conclusions, with a few facts and illustration, but which, I hope, in most cases will suffice. So with all this evidence, why is evolution still called a theory rather than a law? First of all, a theory is quite a lofty designation in science. There's really nothing just uh, about it. But what makes a theory powerful is that it isn't fixed and rigid like a law. It's like a well-written book that has many blank pages waiting to be filled by scientists, possibly even you, in the future. So before we reprise the learning objectives, I want to leave you with this quote, the last sentence of On the Origin of Species, which to me reflects a new paradigm of reverence for our natural world. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. <laughs>